Welcome to SEG Seismic Sound Off, conversations addressing the challenges of energy, water, and climate. I'm your host, Andrew Gary. In this special episode, meet the man behind the mission to diversify the energy sector. Dr. Isaac Crumbly shares the journey of Fort Valley State University's Cooperative Developmental Energy Program, CDEP. Since CDEP's founding in 1983, Dr. Crumbly has been pivotal in diversifying the energy industry's workforce. His innovative approach recognized the value of internships and strategic partnerships to introduce African-American students to the energy industry. At a time when energy companies in the Deep South rarely recruited African-American college students for internships, Dr. Crumbly took matters into his own hands, reaching out to the industry and advocating for his students. The impact of Dr. Crumbly's work is undeniable. President Reagan and President Obama have honored CDEP, recognizing the program's contributions to STEM and the importance of expanding representation in the geosciences. SEG honored Dr. Crumbly in 2021 with a special commendation award. As he shares his vision, Dr. Crumbly challenges the geophysics community to embrace the perspectives of minority individuals and support the journey toward a more inclusive industry. His story is a testament to the power of determination and the lasting change that can be achieved through dedicated effort, or as he puts it, perseverance. Please check out the show notes to read Dr. Crumbly's full biography and explore the links referenced in this episode. And now, it's my honor to present my conversation with Dr. Isaac Crumbly. Well, it's an honor to speak with you, Dr. Crumley. We're going to touch on a variety of topics, but we're going to start kind of where you're based at right now. So what is the mission of the Cooperative Development Energy Program at Fort Valley State University? The mission of uh, the Cooperative Developmental Energy Program is to actually develop a diverse workforce for the uh, energy industry. And so it's it started out there were three other institutions other than myself who got funded, but that was the real mission. And, and, and what it simply put, it was the fact that the energy industry is not very diverse. And so even back in 1983, when I received the uh, request for proposal from the uh, Office of Minority Economic Impact, they recognized that the energy industry really was not very diverse, diverse when it came to uh, gender-wise as well as ethnicity. So that was the thing that created the whole uh, CDEP mechanism. And, and the thing about it was that when I looked at the proposal, the challenge was how do I bring African-American students into contact with the energy industry and vice versa. And so that's, that's how we started. And so simply put, back in 1983, the best way that I thought to immediately make that happen, that is to get the two together, was through internships. So if you go back to 1983, here we are in the deep south, many of the energy companies did not really recruit African-American college students for internship. So it meant that I had to kind of work outside of that space and make contacts myself with the energy industry and then to say, look, you guys, can you, will you hire uh, our students uh, for internships or at least give them a chance to find out about your energy industry and what to do. And to help that out, I also developed a one-hour class with a seminar format to invite members from the energy industry to come to Fort Valley on a Thursday afternoon around 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock to introduce our students to what, what a career like is like in the energy industry. What do they do on a daily basis? So that's kind of how we got that going. Throughout your career, you have just taken advantage of these opportunities that have presented themselves, you know, CDEP in 1983, 
In 92, you established this dual degree program that was is very innovative. Then you went on to found a high school program focused on the STEM field. You know, you just consistently seek out these opportunities. How would you encourage young people to stay aware and be open to opportunities? I feel now we're so conditioned to be very specific and kind of narrow-minded in our goals, but you have stayed very open and been able to make an impact in large part because of that willingness to follow the opportunities. Yeah. Well, well, okay. First of all, I had written a proposal. I had gotten funded and I was supposed to carry out a mission. The, the mission was that, you know, look, you said that you are going to kind of diversify or at least you're going to make pathways or inroads for minority uh, students. And so it was all my life. I grew up on a farm uh, in Arkansas. And so, uh, you know, on a daily basis, there were challenges. And you just routinely say, okay, how am I going to get this done? That was my, you know, my goal was how, you know, how am I going to do this? And so you just sit down and say, well, let me, let me just try this. And so there were a number of challenges now. Like, I, I didn't know anyone in the energy industry, and obviously nobody knew I crumbly, that's for sure. And so I just uh, made contact with a, a person at the Georgia, at Georgia Power who was an African-American. He was, uh, at the time, director of corporate relations with Georgia Power. But he, too, uh, recognized that, okay, you got this funding from the Department of Energy, I'm already working in a, in the company. So it's, it was kind of like a synergy between the two of us. So here I am now. Let's fast forward. That was 1983. So let's kind of fast forward. I, we got the uh, internship program going and, and what have you, and it's real successful as an internship program. But I wanted to establish something for Fort Valley State University that companies would want to come to Fort Valley to get this product. So, and I'm saying an internship program by itself is not going to do it. Maybe I need to start an energy degree program. And so I thought about it and I even went to some of the companies like Georgia Power and say, okay, if I try to develop a, a Bachelor of Science in Energy Science or whatever the case might be, what are some of the things that, that I need to put into that, that curriculum? One of the challenges would be was that we are state university, so we would have to, the program would have to go through the Board of Regents for approval. And the other thing was that, okay, how many kids, African-American kids, are going to really want a degree in energy because they're just not? So that left me then, okay, where do I go from here? And I said, well, if I can't do the energy degree program, let me look at disciplines that are important or germane to the energy industry. That's how the geosciences came up. So it wasn't just the geosciences by itself. So I looked at the segment of energy, and, and that was that oil and gas, geoscience, geology, geophysics is very important to that part of the energy industry. Engineering, of course, is important for all aspects of energy industry. And so as I thought about these things, though, Andrew, was that, okay, Fort Valley doesn't offer any of these. I mean, I hear, I got, yeah, these are great things to do, but you, you don't have them. So if you don't have them, you have to go out and get them. So I look for partnering universities. Uh, universities that were kind of located not just anywhere, but kind of located in the oil patch or whatever the case might be, or a state that was very interested in energy. And so I had met a person who had come to Fort Valley, who had worked with the Occidental Petroleum Company, and he had hired one of my kids as a summer intern. And so he happened to be I sat down and talked with him what my challenges were. And I said, I really want, I need, I need to have a geology program, but we're not going to be able to get one here at Fort Valley. 
do you have any suggestions? He says, yes, I'm a geoscientist. I graduated from the University of Oklahoma, which, as you know, that's really in the middle of the oil patch, he said. He said, and they got a young uh, dean there uh, that's very open. And so I'm going to, I'll introduce you to see if we can get the two together. And so he did. His name was Jeff Kempel, who was the dean of geosciences at the time. Jeff and I hit it off really well. And so I said, Jeff, you know, I got this program I'm trying to develop. We are not going to get geology or geophysics there. Would you be interested in a dual degree program? And he says, why, yes, I would be interested in that. So you were asking me, how did, how did I get to where I am? It's just that they were challenges that I needed to get done. And so you just say, this is what you need, and you just go do it. That's what that's that's how I got there. That's my whole life is kind of like that. That's really neat how you started life as a farmer and, and you have just kept up, you know, you just have to make things work with what you have on hand and and figure it out as you go along. And one of the the amazing things now, 40 years in, you founded CDEP, as you mentioned in 1983. It's been honored and recognized by the US, you know, both Presidents Reagan and Barack Obama have honored CDEP and yourself. Why, why do you think this, this need to expand representation in the geosciences is a bipartisan issue? In the case of uh, President Reagan, I think he was honoring more of the STEM aspect of the, of the program overall because he knew that that was very important anyway for America. Now, in regards to uh, the Paisman Award, that I got from Barack Obama, that too is the nation's highest STEM mentoring award. And here again, it was not just the geosciences, but it was engineering, it was mathematics, it was health, physics, it was all a combination of those things. And so the geosciences, it just so happened that we were successful and really getting African-American students to look at geology or geophysics as a, as a major and also as a career. All of these students that I recruited in order to navigate Fort Valley State University in three years in a STEM discipline and then go on to the University of Oklahoma or UNLV in and later on, some of the other universities, and get out of there with a second Bachelor of Science degree in five years, it really required very smart students, academically talented students. And so we gave them an opportunity to look at pathways that they wanted to go into, but also to look at the career aspirations that they, they might have, you know, Geology and geophysics to work for oil and gas companies is really a good thing. And so, whereas African Americans might not have been used to geology, geophysics, but they were quite aware that the industry paid very well. They also was quite aware that really there was little or no pathways for them to really get into these companies. And so when we were building the program, Jeff and I at the University of Oklahoma, we let the companies know that it was a partnership, that you have been saying that you would hire African-American students in the geosciences, but you can't find them. And we said, that's not going to be your problem. We are going to find them for you. But the, the kids that you're going to have, we don't have the money to support them. So we have a partnership. Ike is going to recruit them. You're going to provide them with the scholarship money. Then they're going to come here and we'll pick up the geoscience degrees. So that's kind of how that really came about. And though, you know, Andrew, we have produced 51 students through this dual degree part of the pipeline. Now, you know what I know in the scheme of things, 51 out of out of an American, total American population is my new, I mean, you know, yet the 51 is really very large when it comes to African-Americans choosing geology and geophysics. 
which lets you know just how underrepresented uh, African Americans are uh, in the earth sciences. With this program, my limited, the thing that limits me uh, is really funding. If I were to say, this is a football player, a blue chipper, you would understand that. But they, these are academic blue chippers. They're, they're not playing football, they're not playing basketball, but that's what I'm recruiting. What motivates you now that is different from when you were in your 20s? I really get a tremendous feeling of appreciation and thankfulness that the program that has been created has had an opportunity to impact the lives of a lot of students. And so what drives me is that bringing youngsters in to that same program, that same pipeline, is really fulfilling. It just overrides anything else. I'm so thankful to the friends that I've made in government and with energy companies and all around that I've gained support, you know, for the program. And the other thing is that I always wanted to leave something with Fort Valley State University or any other institution that I really worked at that would enhance the university and its ability to recruit very talented, academically talented students. And this program at Fort Valley, the CDEP program, has been able to do that. And so that is what drives me each day uh, to come to work. So I enjoy looking for funds, writing proposals, and that's not really fun, as you know, writing proposal. <laughs> but but the cause is more important than than the drudgery that comes with it. Yeah, what it represents. I, I love what you said about the the fifty one blue chippers. You know, I, I'm thinking of any university if they had fifty one first round draft picks in the NFL draft, that would be celebrated by that university. And that's essentially what you're doing. So the numbers sound small, but Really, in the grand scheme of things, these are top-notch academic professionals and now energy professionals that who knows what kind of impact they could make. And, you know, this is an applied geophysics community that that you're speaking with. Probably most of our listeners are geophysicists or certainly geoscientists work at many oil and gas companies. Is there a challenge you would like to leave them from this conversation? Well, from this conversation, I hope that they will be able to see out of the eyes of, of an African-American professor or a minority individual. The way I look at, at things, and I guess it's, it's kind of something that everyone looks out of the window of life. But if I look out the window of life as an African-American, I see one thing. I see opportunities, but I also see tremendous challenges and roadblocks to those opportunities. On the other hand, if I were a white male, I would be looking out the same window. I would also be looking out and saying that, well, there are challenges that I have to go through as a white male, but the challenges are different. White males, will take their challenges to other white males who are in position to help. On the other hand, those individuals that's helping a young white male is not going to be have the same concept of helping me as a young African-American. It's not that they plan that. It's just they're unfamiliar. It's unfamiliar territory. So it's conversations like what we are having here, that you're beginning to kind of see how I see the world. You know, I uh, have a good friend who works at the University of Arkansas, and, and he is an outstanding professor, and um, he's, he's white. And so 
we kind of get into this conversation. I say, you know, you and I will walk side by side down this street, this sidewalk. You're seeing one America, the one that you're used to. But as an African-American, I'm walking side by side, seeing the same cars, trees, and what have you. But I'm seeing a different thing. That's just the way it is. And so part of my success has been able to recognize, you know, that kind of differences and be able to work within, within what really exists. And, and so that has, I think, has a lot to do with the success that I've had, you know, with this program. So that would be what I would leave with them, that give minorities, women, an opportunity to show what, what can be done. And I guarantee you that things overall will be better for everyone. So as a good lead into this last question here, if you had to describe your journey in one word, what would it be and why? Very simple, perseverance. Obviously, I have had many obstacles to overcome, but you just get up the next morning and you start all over. You, you continue to on that journey. Right now, the obstacles that I had at the age of 30 or years old, they're different. I've been able to overcome some of those obstacles. I've gained wisdom. I've made many mistakes. I've learned much more from my mistakes than I ever learned from my successes because it was my mistakes that really helped me to have successes. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Well, the, the career and programs you've built at Fort Valley State certainly showcase that perseverance and just continuing to get at it day after day. And we could speak for a very long time, but, it, you know, as, as the conversation wraps up, is there anything I should have asked you that I did not that you, you want to, to share now before you go? You know, I'm trying to think there. I, I think you've done a very thorough job. I'm hoping that the individuals who will listen to this podcast maybe be able to see a little bit out of the eyes of an African-American professor. The real thing is that, I guess the elephant in the room is that why was it really necessary to have a CDL program? It was the situation that created that something needs to be done. Some kind of program needs to be developed so as that you would have uh, African-American young scholars would have an access to careers in the energy industry. Frankly speaking, all those, you know, CDL is successful. I wish that the conditions didn't exist, why it was necessary to have a CDEP program. Well, I appreciate your time very much today. It's great to share with our audience about this program and to meet you and learn a little bit about you. And you won a SEG honored you in 2021 with a special commendation award, uh, well-deserved, clearly. And uh, I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Andrew. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Seismic Sound Off. SEG creates these episodes to celebrate and inspire the geophysicists of today and tomorrow. Visit seg.org to learn more. If you have episode ideas or feedback for the show, or want to sponsor a future episode, email the show at podcast at seg.org. This episode was hosted, edited, and produced by me, Andrew Gary, at Treasure Mint. The SEG podcast team is Jennifer Cobb, Kathy Gamble, and Ali McGinnis. The podcast will return next week with a new episode. Until then, this is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off.